Hey everyone and welcome to the Engineering Toolbox channel. So building off my last video where I discussed the basics of control charting and statistical process control, I'll be discussing how to interpret control charts and the eight control charting rules. These are known as the Nelson rules, one of which I covered in the last video and the other seven being rules that can be employed to increase charge sensitivity and detect certain signals in our processes. Control charting rules help us detect two things, shifts and patterns. Shifts are phenomena that occur when some special cause has made the process change or move. Obviously there can be different amounts of shift. In other words, a process can shift a large amount or just a small amount. Patterns are arrangements of data that can emerge when a special cause is influencing the form or shape of the data. These are things like trends or certain sequences. Let's look at an example data set. Do you see any shifts? Any patterns? Just visually we might be able to look at the data and see some patterns or shifts. Here might be a trend, this might be a shift, this looks like it could be some kind of pattern, but we want to be a little bit more certain. Luckily, these rules aren't just made up or arbitrary. Each rule detects a phenomena in the data that would be statistically unlikely to happen if all the variation in the process were normal or just random. So with that, let's dive into the rules and see what they tell us. As I introduce these rules, I want to discuss some background and history of control charts. Then I'll circle back and discuss each rule in depth, as well as some general control charting practices and how the rules can be used together. So the concept of control charts was introduced by Walter Schuhart back in the 1920s. He used the three sigma limits to detect large process shifts. So if any data points fell outside these limits, he could be pretty confident that there is a special cause behind that shift. Then in the 1950s, Western Electric developed a standard for process control charting that built upon Schuhart's method. Their standard included three additional rules that could be used to increase chart sensitivity and detect smaller process shifts. Western Electric's rule number one was the same as Schuhart's. Western Electric's second rule is a test to see if two out of any three sequential points are greater than two sigma from the mean on the same side. Similarly to rule number two, rule three looks to see if four out of five data points are greater than one standard deviation from the mean on the same side. Western Electric's last rule, rule number four, tests to see if there is a run of eight data points in a row on the same side of the mean. So this Western Electric standard became popular in industry and in fact is still used and referred to. But then in the 1980s, another player in the SBC realm released his method, which included an additional four rules for detecting certain patterns in the data. Nelson's first rule was the same as Schuart's and Western Electric's. His second rule was actually pretty much the same as Western Electric's rule number four, only he recommended using nine data points in a row. Then his third rule was a test for a pattern of six or more data points in a row, increasing or decreasing. The fourth rule looks for 14 data points in a row, alternating, increasing, and decreasing. Nelson's rule number five and number six are actually the same as Western Electric's rules number two and three. Again, those are looking to see if two out of three points are greater than two standard deviations from the mean, and if four out of five points are greater than one standard deviation from the mean. Nelson's seventh rule is a test to see if 15 data points in a row are within one standard deviation from the mean on either side. And finally, rule number eight is a test for a sequence of eight with points on both sides of the mean but none of the data points fall inside of one standard deviation of the mean on either side. For the rest of the video, I'm gonna be focusing on Nelson's eight rules and referencing the rules using his numbering system. So now we'll discuss each rule in depth so we can understand exactly what they can help us detect. Rule number one is pretty straightforward. This rule will detect any large shifts in the process and provides the strongest evidence for special cause variation. If any data point falls outside of three standard deviations from the mean, we can be pretty confident that we have a signal. And this really comes down to the empirical rule. The farther the point is outside of the three sigma limits, the stronger the evidence for special cause variation. Rule number two can be used with rule number one to increase chart sensitivity to small but sustained process shifts. If we have nine points in a row on the same side of the mean, we can be pretty sure that the process has shifted, even if it's only slightly. There's probably some special cause or change to the process that caused the slight shift. Rule number three is a controversial one, even though it seems like it would make perfect sense. If we have six data points in a row sequentially increasing or decreasing, it may be a sign of a trend. This may be an indication that the process is slowly shifting. And this seems to be perfectly logical, but the reason it's controversial is because the likelihood of six points in a row falling between three sigma levels is very low. So the thought is that this rule most likely wouldn't detect a signal any faster than rule one. So why use it? This rule becomes even less effective if we are using other rules like two, five, and six. However, some argue that this rule can still be useful for finite data sets like number of defects or production volume. This rule can also be useful for detecting trends in short-term variation charts like range charts. Rule number four will detect a pattern that may indicate one of two things, a mixture or a systemic over-control. 
mixture meaning a mix of two underlying processes in the same chart. For example, samples are being taken from two different shifts or two molds in a die and plotted on that same chart. Systemic overcontrol happens when something or someone is overcorrecting the process and as a result is causing an oscillating up and down pattern in the data. It's recommended that this test be used when initially setting up the control chart to identify if these phenomena are occurring so that they can be corrected before further monitoring of the process. The fifth rule, as I said, is a test for medium process shifts. It can be used in conjunction with rule one to increase chart sensitivity to intermediate shifts. The sixth rule is a test for small process shifts, which can be used with rule one and five to increase chart sensitivity even further. Using rules five and six with rule one and two will achieve maximum control charting sensitivity. However, if you're already getting a signal from rule one, the additional rules won't provide any additional insight into the process because you already know the process is prone to large shifts. Rule seven can detect two things. First, it can detect issues with the subgrouping or sampling method. A pattern of 15 points in a row within one standard deviation of the mean can be mistaken as good control when really it's just a result of subgroups that have samples taken from multiple processes. That being said, this will only occur in subgroup charts like X-bar charts. Using rule 7 in this way should only be used when setting up the control chart. If this pattern is detected, you should always go back and look at your subgrouping method and make sure rational subgroups were used. So to explain this further, let's look at an example. Here's an X-bar and R chart with a subgroup of four monitoring a plastic molding process. Everything looks to be in control, except using rule number seven, we can see that something fishy is going on here. Pretty much all the data points are within one sigma of the mean. So what if we look at a chart of all the individual values without averaging the subgroup values? Let's just look at a small section. So here are the individual values of each sample. These are the four values that were subgrouped to make the 20th sample set. The values are split into pairs, two above the mean and two below. Same thing for the 21st sample set. The result is a bunch of x bar values that are close to the x double bar value. So basically what's happening in this case is there are two separate sub-processes that are being sampled from, which results in all subgroup sample sets averaging close to the mean. Now rule number seven may actually be an indication that the process variation has actually been reduced through some sort of process improvement or change, so keep that in mind as well. If that is determined to be the case, you should recalculate the control limits to monitor process going forward. Okay, finally, rule number eight is another rule for detecting mixture patterns. Just like rule number four and seven, we often see this pattern when we are sampling from two different underlying subprocesses. These phenomena will usually result in a bimodal distribution of the data used in the control chart. That's why you should always look at the distribution of the data before control charting a process. You should look at both the individual values and the subgrouped values. And again, this is a rule that should only be employed when setting up your control chart. All right, now for some final points about using these eight rules. First of all, it's important to realize that rule number one will capture essentially all of the large process shifts. So if you're getting signals from rule one, then the other control charting rules will provide little additional insight into the control of the process because you already know it's not stable. Signals from rule one should always be top priority to investigate and correct. This is part of the reason why adding additional rules into your analysis should be done so with caution and consideration. The amount of resources you have to analyze, investigate, and improve upon any signals you detect should always be considered. The more rules you employ, the more signals you will detect. If you want to act upon those signals, it's going to require resources, so you need to decide what is economical and manageable. The other reason to carefully consider how you use these rules is that for each additional rule, the risk of false positives increases. While these rules are based on phenomena that are statistically unlikely to happen in a stable process, there is still a small percentage chance of them actually happening and it just being normal variation. And that risk of false positive compounds as we add more rules. Beyond the risk of false positives, we should realize that there are also diminishing returns on the additional detection power gained from each additional rule. In other words, the amount of sensitivity gained by each rule decreases for every rule that we add to our analysis. Here's a breakdown that shows what I mean. We can see that as more rules are added, the additional power gained is minimal and the risk of false alarms increases steadily. All of this is explained in detail by Dr. Wheeler in an article which I'll link to in the description. Another thing worth noting is that rules 2 through 8 should only be used on charts that analyze continuous type data sets. So these rules should not be used on p-charts, u-charts, or anything like that. The data set should also be close to normally distributed because all the probabilities for signals and false alarms for each of the rules were calculated under this assumption. And then the last thing I want to talk about is that rules 1 through 4 can be used for secondary charts like MR, R, and S charts. Just be aware of what each chart is telling you. X bar and X charts are analyzing long term or between subgroup variation, while MR, R, and S charts are analyzing short term or within subgroup variation. Let's look at an example where this might be useful. Say we have a machine cutting a shaft to length. Here is an X bar and R chart of that data. The X bar chart shows no signs of a signal. 
but we can see that rule 2 is being violated on the range chart. That means we can be pretty confident that there has been a small shift in the short-term consistency of the process. This could be an indication that the machine is degrading in some way. Maybe a bushing was cracked or something is loose. The machine degrading wouldn't necessarily affect the between subgroup variation of the process because even though the variation in the samples is increasing, the X bar values might still average out to be within the normal range from subgroup to subgroup. The between subgroup variation is more than likely influenced by things like machine settings. So based on this analysis, it might be time to call maintenance so they can tighten things up. This video was pretty in-depth and I think that's a good thing because control charting is a very powerful tool that engineers can use, but unless we really understand how to interpret them, we either won't get the most out of them, or worse, we might actually misuse them, which could lead to incorrect assumptions about the process. So we covered a little history, including Walter Schuart, the Western Electric Standards, and the Nelson Rules. And we dove a little deeper into each rule and finally wrapped with some general considerations and notes. So hopefully now you have a pretty good understanding of control charting rules and how to interpret them. Thank you so much for watching, and if you liked this video, please give me a like and be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any future videos that I'm trying to release every week. I cover topics like Excel for engineers, engineering software, and much, much more, so please check all of that out. Thank you again, and we'll see you guys next time.